Dr. Horolak, welcome back to the Health Path podcast. It's always a, a real treat to be able to pick your brain for an hour. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be back, Alex. It's always good chatting with you for an hour too. <laughs> so um, we were just kind of chatting off air and deciding that we'll go with the theme of of breath testing ultimately is, is something that we can dive into today. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have all sorts of different, I guess, quite specific questions that I'd be interested in getting your opinions on. But um, I always like to, I guess, throw the ball into the court of our guest. So is there, a, do you think, quite an organic, natural part to start if we're talking about breath testing? I mean, maybe just its its overarching role within gut health compared to some of the other tests out there. Okay. But I, I think breath testing is, is an essential tool that in, in clinical practice for a gut-focused clinician. So people that see a lot of, of gut conditions, I think, I'd be hard pressed to actually very hard pressed diagnosing accurately and getting an idea of what's going on with my patient without it. So I do a lot of, of breath testing and that that's been, it, it's sort of grown from, you know, over probably the last 15 years, I dare say, when I think back to having a little bit of hesitancy initially around it and, and a little bit unsure to, to now it's like a mainstay and you know, anyone presents with a certain symptom cluster, then I'm like, I'm not going to guess or I'm going to you know, presume what's wrong. Let's do testing and get some accurate data around that. But I do, I do think for me, it, it is the importance of yes, breath testing and doing it frequently for the patients who, who require it. But I think it's, it's what tests, what sugars we test as well. And I think this is the huge thing too, that I, I really have um, a passion about. And, and this to me evolved, I think it used to organically, because it did evolve organically for me in terms of what my, my strategy for breath testing. Um, and I think it just grew out of the fact that I was, you know, teaching, you know, natural approaches to gastroenterology at University of Western States and their master of science and functional medicine program. And I was teaching people fructose intolerance, um, as well as SIBO. But when I had patients who, who presented with, you know, potential reactions to apples or to watermelon or to cherries, I'm like, okay, well, those are fruits very high in fructose. Let's, let's test that. But I also want to test because the symptom pat, pat, um, pattern, it matches SIBO. <laughs> so let's, let's test the, the you know, SIBO sugars. And obviously there's like, you know, a, a drive for using lactulose as the only sugar in, in North America. Um, and then there's a drive in, in Europe for often using gl glucose. So as a um, Australian trying to straddle both worlds, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to use lactulose and glucose. And then I want to start doing fructose testing on these patients too, because I suspected that they were reacting to fructose. And then, well, what I found was really quite an interesting pattern. And was that um, essentially the, the classic fructose intolerance pattern that I'd read about in my papers um, did not occur. <laughs> very few, very, very common at all. And that's where the fructose is, is, is not absorbed, reaches the colon, and then the breath gases spike up at the colon time point. I was not seeing that for very, very few patients was that pattern showing up. What I was seeing is these massive spikes on hydrogen and or methane or at the, the 20 minute mark and 40 minute mark. And so it's like, you know, small bowel territory. And it's just, became quite interesting. So I was like, oh, well, that's, that's fascinating. And then you treat those people for who have fructose intolerance for SIBO and their fructose intolerance goes away. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's not what the books tell me either. Like all the papers are like, oh, it's lifelong low fructose diet or, you know, like all these sort of long, long lasting irreparable things you couldn't fix, you know, kind of scenario. And it's like, well, this is, is, is quite different than that. And that this becomes a, an immensely treatable condition. Um, and I also had patients who brought me when, when I started going through this process, I had patients bring me their previous breath tests that their you know practitioners they saw years ago said, hey, you, you got fructose intolerance. Um, and they, you know, been off, I think one patient who was like six years on a low fructose diet when she came to see me, her symptoms definitely improved on that low fructose diet, but she still had reactions that were just less so in and um, than what they were before. But when I looked at her breath results, it was like, oh, well, you've got SIBO <laughs> induced fructose intolerance. Um, let's treat that SIBO which we did. And all of a sudden, you know, after six years on this restricted diet and, and still having symptoms, she was able to completely expand her diet and eat all these different foods again without getting symptoms because we, we cured the fructose intolerance because it was essentially caused by SIBO. And that's kind of grown organically. And so now for me, it's, it's really pivotal that we actually, um, because a number of cases, like every, like probably at least twice a month, I have patients and sometimes twice a week um, where if I had only done lactulose, I would have completely missed the diagnosis. 
Like, you know, the lash looks look normal or the lash looks kind of flatlined. Um, but thankfully, I didn't rely just on lash loads because I did a fructose and sometimes a glucose as well. And boom, I see this massive spike on fructose. I had one of those patients just last week where, you know, she came to see me and said, oh, I just got this look at my lash with breath test. I don't have SIBO. And I'm like, well... <laughs> You can't say that actually. You can say that you're, you're, this this one was was normal, but let's do a fructose to be sure. Um, and we did the fructose, and she was, you know, her lactulose was totally normal, but her fructose, she was spiking at the 20 minute mark, and it was like 110 parts per million hydrogen. It was like wow. outrageously, it was like really high, very obvious um, wow. that that SIBO was still there. It's just that the bacteria in her, her small bowel were not lactulose consumers, so hence we don't actually get to see a rise in breath gas. Okay. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of significant findings there from your clinical experience. And I guess, you know, this idea that uh, fructose, and I think I'm right in saying lactose, you know, can often be secondary to yeah. SIBO. So you need yeah. to be thinking around the substrates that we're using in the testing, as you say. Um, and, and also that you can see these different spikes with the different substrates. Um, yeah. Yeah. And is that is that related to the the actual type or species of bacteria that has overgrown in the small intestine? Essentially, they're selective for one of those sugars. Yes. And I think that's my hypothesis. Anyway, and it makes sense because we know lactulose is, is selectively fermented. Not all bacteria have the metabolic equipment required to consume lactulose, whereas fructose and glucose are heavily consumed by pretty much all bacterial species. Um the challenge with the glucose, as we know, is that it is really avidly absorbed as well. So that if you do have SIBO in the proximal bit of your small bowel, glucose is good at picking it up. It's just that if your SIBO is in the middle bit or the distal bit of your small bowel, glucose won't see it. And I think this is where the, the other value of fructose is, is that fructose is poorly absorbed. You know, it's, it's what's a facilitated active diffusion, I think is the term for it. So it's very slow. So that dose of fructose is going to reach the middle of the, of the small bowel and potentially the more towards the distal small bowel and people and everybody who takes a dose of sort of 25 grams that we're using breath testing. So we're able to see that that small bowel in, in its entirety, like we're always talking with people talking about lactulose for, but it's just that we're not using a selective we fermented substrate we're using a, a universally selected substrate we're able to see um a bunch of different species that we might miss and we clearly do miss when we're just using lactulose on okay. its own and what are your thoughts on the the dose of fructose that's used in a test because i've read that there was certainly one paper that kind of criticized a little bit the amount that was being used and compared it to the amount of fruits you would have to consume to consume that amount of actual fructose so do you think that's an issue? Do you use sort of a lower than typical dose or do you think actually it's all okay? I think it's all okay. And I feel <laughs> that comes from my experience, but as well, doing the tests and seeing the results and seeing the, the yes, the positive test results, and then we treat it and then it things normalize on that same dose of fructose at a later time point. Um, and I think there's, it's long been known that that there's a dose threshold with with fructose for you know fructose intolerant people um because of and that was the classic fructose intolerance where as i said it reaches the colon and it's fermented mm -hmm. and you know there's if if you genetically speaking are able to 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 absorb that fructose better then you would have less reach the colon than other people but you know if you gave everybody 75 grams of fructose i think pretty much everyone should would show signs of, of malabsorption and rise in, in, in from a colon perspective you know but i think from that this dose seems to pick up i can say just clinically speaking small bowel overgrowth really well it's not to say that you know 15 gram might work just as well, you know, I don't know, but I think that a 25 gram probably ensures that there's some fructose that will reach the middle and distal bits of the small bowel. Whereas I think if you use a five gram dose or 10 gram dose, then you won't. And you're often ordering these as two in people that are reacting to half an apple or you know, right. a couple, a couple of cherries, which makes me think that they're already pretty sensitive to even a low dose of, of mm. fructose. But, you know, as far as I'm aware, no one's been like particularly systematic about it going, particularly with this, like grabbing this cohort of people who have SIBO and induce, you know, secondary fructose intolerance, we could, we're not better off calling it and doing different systematic doses of, of fructose and see, okay, was there some that are better than others? Because I think really it's, it's been a, a, a neglected sugar for assessing um, for SIBO. Um, as well, which I think 
I'm, I'm hopeful that discussing it, getting information around that, and you know, working with a, a PhD student who we're, we're doing different sort of breath testing suites on patients with fibromyalgia, which is providing interesting data around fructose specifically, that hopefully it'll drive more research into this area. Because I personally would say from, from my clinical experience over the last decade that I think fructose is actually the most accurate single sugar to picking up um, a SIBO. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Mm. Which then I guess almost opens up a nice segue into the interpretation of these tests, which, you know, some will yeah. say can be quite challenging and certainly experience can be really helpful, I think, within that. And the, from my perspective, the most common theme or conversation would be obviously how transit is a, a big factor in being able to interpret these results. So what are your thoughts on sort of, I guess, the interpretation of these within the context of transit and all the other variables that come into this? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that is something we always definitely have to have on our mind. Um, and and I think it's been interesting, again, being in this field for long enough to see where it, it used to be like what I'd call the Wild West <laughs> Of, of breath test interpretation that people be like oh, 140 minutes it's still small bowel or 120 minutes it's still small bowel and it's and the research never said that by the way so it's nice to see that there's been a bit of well from that north american consensus document in 2017 it's like okay well there basically most people said 90 minutes is where the cutoff is and i think that's what the science said in them and i was that's what i was basing my, my decisions on previous to that the, the consensus because i think that was my reading was too it's like 90 minutes is the average time but there are people that are less than that i mean i know from um oh, what is it? i think people from you know indian subcontinent will have a quicker transit time and uh, they're the mean one was actually before under 90 minutes i think people from taiwan there's one study too showing it's like 80 some minutes so i think looking at that with your patient taking on board things like anxiety you know we know the patients who are anxious sometimes have a sped up transit time too. And there's certainly research suggesting that's the case. They're going, okay, well, you know, is that rise at 80 minutes actually colonic or small bowel? Whereas I think there's, there's less debate to me when it's at the 20 minute mark or 40 minute mark, but there will obviously be like, if you took, you know, 5,000 people and you give them breath tests, there would probably be people who would have a colonic fermentation at 20 minute mark the, in that, in that huge cohort. But I think it's, it's really rare um, for that to occur. Um, and I think, Ideally, it's if we could actually do something to measure small bowel transit time at the same time would be wonderful. And they certainly do that in research settings. It's yes, simple in that scenario. We use scintigraphy or a smart capsule, and boom, you can you can correlate these things of when it actually reaches the colon when the breath gases went up. Um, but we don't have access to that so much in in our day to day practice as yet. That might change with you know smart pill technology in you know, fifteen years time or something, but. Okay. on the short term so we you know, yes you have to i think take that to account and that person again if they're doing six bowel movements a day or 10 bowel movements a day clearly diarrhea um like i, I do bowel transit time tests like the you know the low tech variety and pretty much all my patients where they have some you know corn on the cob some sweet corn some black and red quinoa write down when they eat it when it when they first see it come at the other end and when they finish it's coming out the other end and if it's coming out in four hours time or six hours time i'm going to be pretty clued in that they're Gut transit time is really quick, and I uh, should probably interpret their, you know, take that on board when I'm considering their their test results. Um, so I think there 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 is that to consider too. Whereas I think some people who have ten day transit times or fifteen days when they actually see the, um, you know, a corn come out the other end then you might even look at okay, well we don't know what the small bowel transit time is because that's obviously mostly clonic. But again, you might have a little bit of flexibility with how you interpret things mm. if there was a rise at the um 100 you know 90 minute mark 100 minute mark or you know you might correlate with their symptoms and everything else and go okay what's going on but i mean i think mostly for those people that they've got methane issues anyway and that will show up um early on the test point honestly with a sometimes with a spike obviously but sometimes it's there at baseline you know that high methane okay now, I just want to check on something that I'm pretty sure you said in our last conversation, and I'm hoping you did because I've said it about a thousand times since that last conversation. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> is, um, you know, we touched on the sweet corn test as, you know, uh, as you say, a low tech at home yeah. um, evaluation of transit. And I'm sure you said that, you know, you've done that with clients and you've actually found that they might have a good Bristol stool chart oh. bowel movement but yeah. they still might be having a transit time of several days. So we can't yes. just use kind of consistency of the stool as any real 
marker of what's going on there? No, I mean, I think, obviously if they're doing type one pellets, I think we can assume that it's very slow, but I think what was probably surprising for me was having a patient who, and I've had a few now in that boat who had you know, type four on the Bristol, a single bowel movement every single day, never missed a day. So certainly not even close, to, you know, no straining, and no no remote closeness to definition of constipation. But we did a sweet corn test, you know, and then 10 days. Huh. Yeah, and and she she was the one that amazed me most because she had such, you know, perfect bowel movement on. If all I would have gone through was the Bristol and, and stool frequency, I would have gone, oh, all good. No worries there, you know. Whereas that other people were, yeah, they're pooing every two or three days, and I twenty six days is still in my my champion slow ones. Um, yeah, I know, which is incredible. But I had a patient who was just just last week, and this was a young lad. I think he was consistently, I think it was type four, pooing at least once a day. But but we did a fecal X ray in his case because we were suspecting fecal loading, and he was still fecally loaded despite the fact he was pooing every single day. Wow. Um, and his transit time was slow, not surprisingly, too, you know, which, but we wanted to get a bit more of external kind of confirmation about the hypothesis in this, in this case, because there were other things that were making me think of fecal loading, like, like bedwetting, for example, and, and, you know, fecal urgency issues, as well as urinary urgency issues. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, and that kind of opens up a sort of topic around transit time and also pH as from what I see, two of the most important components of what's going to really influence the small and large intestine in regards to the microbiota and how what they're functioning. So I've certainly seen a paper that discussed how pH is an incredibly important environmental factor that's going to influence the bacteria's production of butyrate, if they're butyrate producers, for example. Um, so can you just touch on, I guess, you know, these two these, we've kind of touched on transit a little bit in regards to interpretation of SIBO. Um, but what about from a slightly more general gut health, gut function perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think it, this fits bit back well with the old naturopathic idea of bowel toxemia, you know, and even Hippocrates said, you know, death sits in the bowel and, you know, um, poor digestion is a root of all evil. But I might convert that to, you know, poor gut health is a root of all disease. And I you know, firmly believe that. And I'd say science is coming quite around to that conception. And I think, yeah, microbiota composition, you know, small bowel leakiness, I think we definitely need to be looking at, but I think it's, it's you know, colon or bowel, you know, co leaky colon too, for, for a way of describing it. And I think that happens a lot when we have that slow transit time. So we actually have the fecal contents, we've got bacterial metabolites, endotoxin that actually has got 10 days to get absorbed rather than moving through in 12 hours or 16 hours. You know, that's that's going quite incredibly different. And I think people, I mean, I think even we know this, geez, what are the sayings we have a feeling like crap? You know, it's like, yeah, we in, in, intuitively know that what happens when you actually are full of poo backed up and, and how toxic you feel and how yucky you feel because you're absorbing all those things out of your fecal feces is, is like, we, we kind of know that, but I think it, we should have this very clear in our, our minds as clinicians that this is really important. And when things are backed up and they're fecally loaded then they are reabsorbing you know comments are trying the body's trying to get rid of toxins and rental toxins etc but also lipopolysaccharide which i think is is a huge one because we're just seeing the again the the research is really blooming in the role of, of endotoxemia as a is a causative factor for a range of western degenerative diseases from cardiovascular disease to alzheimer's disease type 2 diabetes obesity being linked in with excessive you know absorption of endotoxins um and i think slow transit time is certainly a core driver of that as well as you know microbiotic composition as okay. well for our um, non-practitioner listeners, can you just expand on sort of the endotoxemia and what we're what we mean by this? Yeah, so so gram-negative bacteria. I suppose take a step back. We've got two basic sorts of bacteria. There's gram-positive and gram-negative. Um, it's whether their ability just to to actually absorb the gram stain, which was made by a microbiologist called Gram, essentially, and the gram-negative ones do not. Um, and, and one of the things that these all gram-negative bacteria have in common is they produce something called lipopolysaccharide, um, LPS, or endotoxin is another term for it. And they grow it just like we grow fingernails, we grow hair, they grow endotoxins. So it's not designed, they're not, not releasing toxin to make us ill, you know, directly um, um, 
in a way that they're like it's a, it's a conscious wave you know it's like some bacteria produce toxins you know this is this is not what they're doing they're not trying to poison you directly it's more of an indirect thing that that's they live and they die when they die they release that endotoxin into your gut and we can cope with the endotoxin quite fine like our our intestinal cells can deactivate it our liver can deal with it and you know the small amounts that are normally produced aren't generally an issue and, and not much gets into the bloodstream but the term endotoxemia and particularly Metabolic endotoxemia is relatively like a lower amount of endotoxin reaches the circulation on a constant basis or, you know, certainly after certain meals and in higher amounts, but maybe 24 hours a day, you've got this endotoxin leaking through. And that's just a core driver of inflammatory changes in the body. And I think that's the thing. It's like endotoxins cause inflammation. Um, how that may manifest may differ a bit per person, you know, but we now know that endotoxins are, you know, core driver of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And when we start looking at multiple sclerosis, we start looking at more sort of neurological conditions, even depression, and anxiety. You know, we can give a dose of endotoxin to a happy, healthy person. They get anxious for five hours afterwards. So just imagine if you've got constant leaking of, of endotoxin into your system and damages the blood brain barrier. It changes what neurotransmitters we produce, uh, makes your insulin less sensitive. Um, so your body has to use more insulin to try to get your blood sugar levels down. It's just a, a a nasty substance. And you know, what determines how much of that is in our bloodstream depends, as I said, on, on how much gram negative bacteria you have in your gut, number one, particularly this uh, a group of bacteria we call proteobacteria, which are things like E. coli, Klebsiella, Citrobacter, Haemophilus, Clivera, um, and cousins, <laughs> release really pro-inflammatory, super inflammatory endotoxin. And then we have other gram-negative bacteria, like in the Bacteroidetes phylum, which would be things like Bacteroides and Prevotella and uh, Parabacteroides, Allostipes, ones like that, where whose LPS is like maybe a thousandfold less inflammatory than what we have from from proteobacteria. But it still adds up a lot if your ecosystem is like eighty percent Bacteroides. Uh, you know, Bacteroides are still in a ton of, of relatively low potency uh, LPS in your system. Um, yeah, so we look at the composition, like how much back of your ecosystem is composed of these gram negative bacteria. What's your small bowel integrity like? So are you, you know, potentially having stuff that leaks through there? Do you have SIBO? And is that SIBO composed of gram negative bacteria, proteobacteria, which is kind of what the more recent studies have, have found? I mean, there's older studies suggesting that, that there weren't uncommon to have, have proteobacteria there too, but I think Pimadol's more recent stuff is suggesting that proteobacteria are probably more common. Um, drivers of, of SIBO. So if you have them in the small bowel and leaky small intestine, you get more coming through. Um, and then as I said, you get the, the slow transit time means that you're, you're, you're getting the endotoxins leaking through your, your colon wall into your bloodstream where they cause harm. Um, and particularly, you know, initially I think your liver can cope with it for a bit, but then it becomes overwhelmed and then it reaches your whole water circulation and even diseases that we, you know, alcoholic induced liver disease, you know, it's, it's, it's endotoxins that are causing the liver damage. You know, it's the alcohol causes leaky gut and alcohol causes, so you get increased absorption of endotoxin. Alcohol causes shifts in the gut ecosystems. We have more gram negative bacteria, more proteobacteria specifically. So we have alcohol and, and it causes small intestinal stagnation um, and it causes SIBO. So you have these things that alcohol is causing, but it's actually the bacterial byproducts that are causing the damage to the liver. You know, even non alcoholic fatty liver disease, they're not linking with endotoxins. Mm -hmm. as well so that's where you know with, your body can deal with it for a bit but eventually it, it starts causing damage to the liver and then more of the endotoxin gets into your system at that point. brilliant so if i was to try and summarize the main message there um you know recent research is showing us that some of these proteobacteria like klebsiella e coli are, are the common organisms that are overgrowing in people with SIBO and they're gram negative and when they die they have this endotoxin lps that is both able to contribute to leaky guts and yes. as they get through the gut lining are triggering a an immune inflammatory response which can then if chronic contribute to a long list of all these modern conditions which are getting to epidemic proportions ultimately um yes okay yeah yeah like type 2 diabetes obesity and i don't think it, even just a cardiac failure like heart failure and they're even think it's it's causing the the atherosclerotic plaques in our bloodstream are caused by the way endotoxin is causing inflammation changes in our blood vessels you know so it's it is i think one of those core really core things that that we as clinicians have to have on our 
radar and as health conscious people need to be aware of so they can do something to change change that because you know uh, you know healing leaky gut we can do that improving gut transit time we can do that treating SIBO we can do that and changing the microbiota colonic microbiota composition we can do that too so there's a lot we can do to to change that scenario if people are willing to put the hard yards in from a dietary um intervention perspective lifestyle intervention perspective and and sometimes and obviously you know supplement, supplements and, and herbs play a role too mm. yeah so i guess i was going to actually ask around that because you mentioned obviously one of the arguably the most important thing is the amount of gram negative bacteria that you have in the gut and I'm assuming that, you know, diet is obviously one of the primary ways that we can therefore modify this. Yeah, it is. And I think it kind of depends on, um, you know, what, what's actually grow- growing. And typically in Westerners, we'll have an overgrowth of bacteroides, um, which is a sort of the key genera in the or genus, sorry, in the um, bacteroidetes phylum. Um, and it just tends to thrive in Western diets. And I always tell my patients, the bacteroides is the omnivorous peak of the gut ecosystem because it it eats a bunch of everything it can eat some fibers it can eat some sugars it can eat some um proteins amino acids and it eats bile you know so it's got this basis pretty pretty covered um but on a western diet the typical western diet which is like low in fiber um but higher in protein and fat for example which then we has more bile it tends to be more dominant because it, while it can consume fiber in general it's less effective at doing so than something like the calibacterium or eubacterium or there might be some other other you know um you know beta rate producing species in the gut that are they're actually more apt at digesting fiber so we have a fiber rich diet we tend not to be dominated by bacteroides it's quite a rare thing we actually have a range of other species who dominate in that that situation um and that, interesting enough, that's we've talked about pH bit before too, but it is, you know, and some of that's been known for a long time too, is that bacteroides doesn't really like a, a more acidic environment. So if we actually create more short chain fatty acids through fiber and prebiotics and polyphenol consumption, we're able to actually change the pH and that brings down the bacteroides level. But as you commented on before too, it, it changes the behavior too. So that, you know, bacteroides produces beta-glucuronidase, which is one of the main enzymes that, you know, re-releases toxins that our body's trying to get rid of or hormones the body's trying to get rid of. So we get a second whack at them. Um, but when you cho- change the pH, it doesn't do that anymore. You know, it can produce ammonia, but we change the pH. It doesn't produce ammonia anymore. It doesn't putrefy amino acids at a lower pH. So we were kind of getting the better behaviors even of, of bacteria when we have a, a more optimal pH. Center. And so and it, it's great to hear you talking about that now, but there was research looking at this in the 1990s um, onwards, even about changes in pH being important to change the behavior of certain species in the gut. Yeah, I'm so glad you reminded yeah. me of that because the... You know, I did a little bit of a PubMed dive into this uh, maybe last week, and yeah. all, the, all the papers were really old. Um, yeah. And it, it's not the first time that I've kind of gone into the research, and you find that it was almost this kind of wave of really interesting research that was really clinically valuable that kind of then doesn't seem to be present in more recent research. That's kind of just being given up on. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Or no, there was some. Kind of find some brilliant stuff that was done in the the 90s you know i think uh cummings and the mcfarlands um i think it retired the last paper i think was 2012 but they spent like i don't know 30 years researching fiber fermentation dynamics in the colon like they added so much to to our current knowledge and yes some of that stuff would have got forgotten um, which actually reminds me of a, a paper because i recently moved and when i was in, I, emptying my garage i found all these boxes of papers that i brought with me back before PDFs were common. So you'd always, you know, special order in these, these, these papers I'd go up to the library and photocopy these things. But it was a paper from the 1980s. And they had people who, um, high methane producers who were constipated and had slow transit time. 1980s. Wow. Yeah. And they were like, because, you know, we always think of, okay, this only happened in the like 2000 something that we can be aware of the role of methane. Well, there's people talking about it back then. It just got lost. Um, but what was particularly interesting in this study, and that, that itself was to me, but they gave these people um, sulfate. I can't remember what sort of sulfur-based compounds. Um, and it sped up their transit time. And they can, they they became hydrogen sulfide gas producers instead. And I thought, wow, oh, that's, 
amazing that they were talking about this so long ago, going, okay, let's shift the, the dynamic of the hydrogen gas consumers in the gut by adding some sulfur compounds, which then preferentially feeds hydrogen sulfide gas producers, and that resulted in speeding out of transit time, um, and constipation went away. Yeah, um, it, was, it was a fascinating paper, and like, man, it was pretty cool that people were talking about in the 80s, but it was one of those ones that was lost. Yeah. Yeah. I am. Um, you remind me of a paper from, it was 92. I, I don't know why I remember that apart from probably yeah. that it's, it's so old and there is, as you say, research that we think is very new that actually was going on a long time ago. And it was the exact same thing. They gave a group of people the sulfurous compound and you saw methane go down. Um, yeah. That did really, that yeah. sort of correlated with the symptom improvement as well. And I've always hypothesized why at least I think clinically I see benefits in things like NAC in sort of my methane based clients, so to speak. So just using some type of sulfurous compounds, as you say, to sort of support that hydrogen economy as they talk about it. Yeah. Hydrogen economy is a good term for it. Um, and I think it also explains why some people, and this used to kind of blow my mind too, but people who go carnivore, for example, who are constipated, they're constantly before they go condor, sorry, and then their bowel movements get better. Mm. <laughs> kind of with like no fiber in it. And your brain's at first going, what's going on there? But it's that hydrogen, they're feeding their hydrogen sulfide gas producers and, and, and instead of the methane producers that may have been there before. And they're completely changing that dynamic. And then the gut transit time speeds up as a consequence. I mean, there are negatives to having over a gut overgrown with hydrogen sulfide gas producers for sure, but they were certainly pooing more than before. And I thought that's just an interesting thing in the short term how how such an extreme diet that you know we would argue has lots of negative shifts to the ecosystem does make them poo more some of these people mm. than what they were actually doing before okay which is an interesting um i mean that also just fascinates me kind of the extreme diets that are out there and some people just thriving on them it seems mm. um i was speaking to dr tom wood recently um who released a paper, which you've probably seen, it was entitled Reframing Nutritional Microbiota Studies. And it was with Dr. Lucy Mailing and one other author, apologies for the third author, I forget your name. Um, but the general, one of the things they spoke about was how there are different subtypes of butyrate. So for example, isobutyrate or beta hydroxybutyrate, I think it is that, you know, you might be producing more of on a keto or a carnivore type diet. And they claimed there was some research suggesting that those sort of different types of butyrate do interact with the same receptors and therefore may be another mechanism by which these diets that can be very lacking in fiber might still be okay from a gut perspective. Oh, like enough to keep, you know, your, your gut cells, clonocytes alive, yeah. for example. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, listen, I haven't delved too deeply into that, but I know when I have looked around that there was certainly evidence that i saw that that the human made sort of beta rate analogs don't do all the same things as the okay. microbially derived beta rate does some of it yes but but not all of it that was really my takeaway from my yeah. reading but it's it been a while since i read yeah. up in, in that particular area um yeah, but uh, thankfully, I would say that there's some overlap there because otherwise, I'd be like, man, there's colonocytes. You know, seventy percent of the energy needs are met by, you know, short-chain fatty acids and butyrate, and if they're getting very little of that, then it bodes particularly poorly for long-term health. And you know, um, so I can't say I've seen particularly. This is the thing about clinically too is you know you you get to see people who, are, who haven't thrived on on said diet, <laughs> and you get to look at their ecosystem and you're like, oh yeah, well. I can see the the you know the 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 bloom of hydrogen sulfide gas producers and the actual lack of butyrate producing species you know and the increased and worsening inflammation in your gut that's come on as a consequence of of that kind of dietary approach but that doesn't preclude I don't see people that are that are blooming on it and going fantastically healthy <laughs> as to see what their ecosystems look like and how their every other aspect of their their um, approaches too so you know um, it's yeah, hard to comment on the people that are, are apparently going brilliantly on it because I don't yeah. get to see them <laughs> in clinical yeah. practice. We need to study. Yeah. We need to study looking at those guys. Yeah, I reckon. Um, I reckon very much so because you'd be just very curious. And and it, I think it's also the short term versus long term thing yeah. too. Like, okay, like you know, if you're 
creating a dietary approach or following a dietary approach that ends up increasing your proteobacteria load and your lipopolysaccharide load in your gut, increase hydrogen sulfide gas production in the gut and decrease speed rate production. Long-term, I think that's going to be detrimental, even if it does have improving your know, blood sugar regulation and some other things in the, the shorter term. And do you think it's possible that some of these people that or have been on these diets for a while, um, is it possible that, you know, we're seeing that shift in the microbiota towards what you just described, but for some reason it might just not be creating a symptom profile at this point in time that connects with it? Because certainly I've seen plenty of yeah. people with significant dysbiosis who, you know, they don't have kind of your classic IBS symptoms. Maybe they have some low level other things going on, which is why we did the test. But then you look at that profile, you go, oh, wow, actually, this is looking like there's quite a lot of work to be done. Yes, I think it's a simple short answer to that one. I, I do. I am concerned that that things will manifest um, potentially a little bit differently in patients, but probably just more over time as well. And, and I suppose my experience with these patients have been that the longer they follow that diet, the harder it is to, to deal to work, help with them, help them because they're got often become so hypersensitive to any sort of plant material or essentially gas, any sort of hydrogen gas production causes them extreme pain or discomfort. Uh, because they're, um, I would argue, the hydrogen sulfide gas overproduction over to year, over months to years has caused um, visceral hypersensitivity become full on. So that even a small amount of gas produced causes extreme pain reactions. That it can be really tricky to come back from that. Because how do you change the ecosystem composition without changing diet? But you can't change the diet because they cause this excruciating pain. You know, so you're in this really tricky situation. So you're doing these tiny baby steps, and you're trying to get some healing going and you're trying to alter things so maybe there'll be less you know how do you target the hydrogen sulfide gas production how do you, you might supplement with external butyrate in a case like that to go okay well this, this will you can't feed your butyrate producers yet <laughs> but at least we can we can provide a lot of external butyrate to, to nurture and, and help deal with that visceral hypersensitivity is one approach yeah. you know so but i just know that some of the hardest patients i've had to work with from a microbiome alteration perspective have been those that have been on those diets long term because the what I would see the amount of damage that was was done to their gut integrity and and gut ecosystem as a consequence interesting excuse me and I don't know if this is a term that I've read in the research or whether I've just sort of thought of the concepts it's I'm sure it's the former but I you know I've used this term of a resistant um dysbiotic microbiome like what you're saying here a, a, dis, a dysbiotic state which just seems to be very resistant to any positive perturbation um you know it's kind of just got set in its in its way and it doesn't want to burn. Yeah. yeah i think sometimes we see that with methane all, all too yeah. often where it's just like some people respond so beautifully to the typical ways we we, we approach mm. you know methane overproduction in the gut and there are others that are just do not budge you know it's it's an interesting one interesting area that one that one i think to me can certainly fit that picture at a higher percentage of time than other you know you know um dysbiotic patterns i would say which then brings on um a question around you know i've certainly read primary research that can indicate that both methane and hydrogen sulfide might be a an adaptive sort of response and that there was one paper and there was a sentence along the lines of how hydrogen sulfide might actually help positively sculpt the microbiome. So do you think there is a time when the body's, you know, doing what it's doing for a reason? Um, and actually it's it's kind of making up for something maybe, but as a result, there's a bit of collateral damage along the way. I, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. No. Um, I do think that a little bit of hydrogen sulfide is, is helpful. All right. So I think that that is clear. It's just that when there's too much being produced, that it's that it's problematic. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it's been so often where it's been people's dietary choices of going, all right, they're having tons of, of dairy fat, and then they get this bloom of bilophila, and then they have visceral hypersensitivity to that. And we take out the dairy fat, bilophila goes down, and we address high hypersensitivity, and then all of a sudden they're no longer have bloating or distension, and their abdominal pain goes. You know, I just work with enough people in that thing where it's the drive the diet that's the driver of the hydrogen sulfide gas producing okay. species overgrowth that i'm not convinced that it's um uh, a, a positive sort of adaptive response gone a bit awry okay interesting yeah. even if i do totally get the, I, right, it's like a little bit of methane is good 
a little bit of hydrogen sulfide is, is good is, is, is helpful for us too it's mm. just that when we have too much of those things that it's it's problematic sure and what about the possibility that both of these gases that we're in, analyzing in the breath are coming from somewhere other than the gut do you think that this is ever a possibility yeah <laughs> i think for for methane definitely is and i think we like the, at, um sharon our one of the the phd students i'm working with we've we published a paper around um exactly that of of the difference for oral hygiene regimens actually changing methane gas levels it was quite an intriguing finding and then you delve into it more and it turns out there are methane producing bacteria in the oral cavity um because we could essentially if you did a there's a few different things we, we 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 talked about in the paper. One of the main takeaways was if you did a like a antiseptic mouth rinse, for example, before your first breath sample, it would artificially lower methane, um, and then it would kind of normalize again after 20 minutes. So you'd look like you might have SIBO when you actually, if you didn't do the breath rinse beforehand, you'd have a yeah, you wouldn't get the rise. It was it was is interesting. So it did suggest that there definitely are methane producing bacteria in the oral cavity, which could impact on breath test results. And it also means too, I mean, one, you know, wonders whether that, sh you know, for some of those people that are, are really recalcitrant methane producers, maybe we need to target something in the oral cavity to be you know, interesting. I haven't really gone down that way clinically, but when I speak about it now, it's like, okay, maybe that's something that might be worth trialing to see whether they're, you know, if the methane producing the oral cavity, does that somehow impact, you know, flow and dynamics of what's happening downstream? Don't know. We haven't researched that yet, but it's worth having on the radar that it is certainly occurring, at least in some patients. Okay. Um, and I'm sure I'm not going to be able to get this particularly, um, well, accurate enough is what it will be. Um, there was a study, I'm sure, whereby the researchers gave the participants, it was a little bit like your 80s study. They gave them a sulfurous compound, um, yep. a medication or something. And it, I think it was... It may have been something like intravenously as well. And they saw an increase in hydrogen sulfide in the breath as a result of that, um, which I thought was was quite interesting. Intriguing um, indeed. Yeah, I'll have to yeah. um, dig out the paper and I'll share it if I can find it because- Yeah, please. Um, I'd be curious with the timeline of that too. Was it like an hour, two hours, six hours, you know? I'm, I'm yeah, curious. off the top of my head, I can't remember, but um, it's yeah. definitely an area that's really intriguing me at the moment, this idea that, how much of this gas might be coming from, as you say, the oral microbiome with methanol yeah. oralis, for example. And I know there's a study of nine refractory sinusitis patients where they found oralis in the sinuses. Um, and a paper kind of theorizes that the mouth, the sinuses, the small and the large intestine could be sites of methane production. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, it, it really is. And we just don't know what the impact of methane production up here mm. is. You know, whether it is impacting... Because I think the, the thing that we see most problematic with methane, obviously, is, is the, the slowing of transit time that yeah. comes as a consequence of that. Um, and, and we get to, and we, we see that in the class of constipated patient, but also the you know, bile toxemia cases we talked about before and in the middle of endotoxemia that related to that slow transit time. So that's where it's obviously problematic when produced lower in the gut. But is it having impact lower in the gut when it, it produced up high? Don't know. Um, yeah. And I think we'll have to wait for more research to be done around that okay um and then i would be a real idiot i've just realized a question that i i'm desperate to ask you which is yeah. around, we're seeing an increasing number of people with elevated baseline samples in hydrogen and yeah in the research they often just talk about maybe it was inappropriate pre-test protocol but it's not like the hardest protocol to get right um so I've, no. kind of, I've always questioned like that being the only strategy and then i've also read in the research that it could be hydrogen that's just lingering from that last meal that did contain fermentable fiber and maybe there is a bit of a transit issue that's blurring it but in so many of yeah i've seen the baseline sample is elevated but the second one's really dropped which would be incredibly convenient that you know they've timed that test wrong by maybe 15 20 minutes and, and now oh. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on kind of elevated baseline samples, whether and if we, you know, maybe two answers, one where they then drop, which is just 
baffles me and then one where it stays yeah I'd, I'd say it baffles most of us <laughs> Alex. <laughs> um i think elevated methane to me is is for the most part i see this as colon fermentation so if you have people who are you know five six day 10 20 day transit time you know fibers they consumed last week are still in that colon mm-hmm. fermenting you know if they've gone fiberless for two days it doesn't you know um so i think that to me is pretty clear but the hydrogen one is interesting you know um i, I don't necessarily buy it because i think you get people who say i followed it to the letter mm-hmm. and they still have this high baseline hydrogen um and interestingly enough there's some labs the like older style um, protocol was to just toss that sample out and then come back again tomorrow and do it again is yeah. just that for people testing at home that's not not an option you don't know until the lab or you know all yeah. the, the results are analyzed but you know i think i think it was it was the, the thought was there was pro- improper prep but i think we know that that's not going to explain all those those cases and i concur that it seemed like it was uh, to me, mostly colonic, likely colonic in origin. That that hydrogen because it could have been from you know you know stuff fermenting for 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 a while beforehand, depending on the person and their their, their transit time. So I think it's always always the transit time when looking and have that. On, uh, I'm analyzing at the same time analyzing my breath samples for the vast majority of patients, so I can at least have those things there to help fill in some potential gaps, sort of to help explain things. But that secondary drop. Yeah, that is just bewildering because mm. it's like, what is what is happening there? Because, yeah, it could, it could, how convenient would that be that that like, was randomly just occur that it's like that was their peak hydrogen and then it, then it dropped down? Um, yeah, and I think there's still stuff we don't know about breath testing, particularly around that. And I don't think that's an area that's ever been particularly well researched at all actually but what does that actually mean because as i said the default answer has always been blame the pay the patient they have yeah. the, the test properly versus this is something real what does it mean um where is that hydrogen coming from how do we you know put it in, in context so i don't think any there's any data showing that provides with an answer and i think i'm still perplexed by that one too particularly the the sort of second drop that comes after that and other people I spoke to who did a lot of breath testing stuff are still no one's quite sure um what's going yeah. on yeah oh I'm glad you said that in some ways <laughs> <laughs> yeah I wish I could provide like a definitive answer yeah, but I don't yeah. think we've got one no. yeah I mean I I got some relief when I read in one paper they quoted a, a doctor who works in a hospital setting doing a lot of SIBO testing and and he his point was similar it was like well, I just started seeing it so much that I just thought it was normal. <laughs> um, so yeah, we yeah. don't seem to have any real rationale there. Um, I have seen one paper that showed if participants go for a gentle walk beforehand, it can lower breath, the baseline. Yeah. Um, I think I've heard that too, which is also intriguing because it's like, how do we standardize breath testing, you know, a pre-preparation? So I think that's a huge thing, even in even diet, you know, it's like, how strict do we do that diet from the eat just white rice and meat to just do low FODMAP diet for, you know, a day beforehand. There's different labs handle that one a bit differently. <coughs> Sorry. And, and I think I could even, from a methane perspective, I think sometimes having higher fiber diet for leading up to tests can actually be more valuable because it will tell us whether you are definitely a methane producer, but if you went like no fiber for a week um, and your baseline methane is obviously not going to be there, you just have to hope that the lactulose reaches your colon in three hours, which is quite likely, but there'll be the odd person where probably it may not if the small bowel transit is immensely slow, um, which I think is rare. But yeah, I've always I've been more comfortable with a less extreme diet pre-breath testing personally i think for a few reasons one because i think it's easier for the patients um, my patients tell me that they're like oh this is so much easier than the white rice and meat <laughs> version for right. a couple days beforehand um and i think we get uh, a, a more accurate picture of normal methane levels okay. as well interesting um, with such a, such an approach mm. um but probably higher risk of, of, of higher hydrogen at baseline too yeah, yeah. okay so I guess you could say, depending on what you are thinking, you want to prioritize in some cases, whether you're more interested in yeah. evaluating that methane. Um, yeah, and, and I think there's even some research looking at, you know, um, I can't remember, it was a relatively recent publication 
came out of the states and they were just doing all it's just just do all kind of spot methanes and they kind of compared that to other ways of assessing methane and that would end up being a very accurate way and so if you have your own lab breath lab it's great you just do the one breath sample and go oh are you producing methane or not simple to get above that 10 parts per million great we can that means you're positive we can treat you which i love the idea of but I don't have my own breath labs. <laughs> my patients have to do like the full suite of sugars. Then we get all that sort of data back. Um, but I think it, it, it's in that sort of area that, okay, well, for methane that there, I don't know if there's any great advantage to going on a really super low fiber diet for numerous days beforehand, because we kind of want to know what the normal methane um, levels are for you. Okay. Um, and maybe my final question, because I'm mindful of time. Yep. Um, is there any theory or even research around sort of, I guess, hydrogen production within the context of sort of our, our mucus layer and what could be going on from that perspective? I'm just wondering whether certain bacteria degrading mucus, does that produce gas that would then impact on any of these things? Well, I think the degradation of mucus often leads to more hydrogen sulfide gas production and it's not unusual for you to see a um high level in people with lots of mucus in their stool have higher level of hydrogen sulfide gas and i think there can be a you know vicious circle thing there too because we can know we can cause inflammation in larger amounts but then i think inflammation and excess mucus production can actually be a driver of of increased populations of that microbe is a group of microbes as well okay um, I do have one other question. <laughs> I just don't mm. know when I can speak to you again, Dr. Horolat. So I'm just picking your bait. <laughs> okay. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. What was my question? It was around. Um, oh, am I going to even remember it? Um, ah, yes. Hydrogen sulfide. And, and going back to this hydrogen economy that, you know, our bacteria yeah. have fiber, they produce hydrogen. That hydrogen then can be inverted to acetate hydrogen sulfide methane. Yes. There's a paper that was discussing how we're only going to see those um, sort of secondary pathways when the hydrogen pathways have been saturated. And therefore, you might not see, okay. you're only going to see methane and hydrogen sulfide in the breath test if it's able to detect both once those metabolic pathways of hydrogen production are, are full. Mm. I was wondering what your thoughts were on, on that. It oh, kind of interesting. changes how we interpret these things. It would. I haven't read that that paper, so I have to plead a bit of ignorance around that and, and the theory that they're working with there. Um, I mean, I think it, there would always be a degree of that because there would be some places where the hydrogen goes to. But... Oh, I mean, I've just read so much about that the hydrogen economy that <laughs> where it's more talking about that hydrogen being shunted, not really staying as hydrogen that yeah. much as either becoming one of those those three different pathways. Um, that I'm unsure how much a role of that that actually has, and I don't know. If we we oh, I haven't read that paper, so they might have a lot of beginning research around trying to tease this out, where there's more of a theoretical thing of going, okay, mm. well, in theory, hydrogen can do all these things, and if it, if it yeah, that that might be impacting the amount of hydrogen left to feed other microbes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, which is a bit different from other concepts that I've read around the hydrogen economy. Yeah, it's very, uh, very different, but I quite yeah. like different different perspectives are always <laughs> yeah well sometimes it, it helps us stretch and, and and grow from what we we knew before. Yeah. You know, um yeah, so to, to challenge sort of the the thinking around things, even and that does not necessarily challenge it in a huge way, but it's challenging a, a bit of going, okay, well, what if it's only, you know, for the, which again goes into the, you know, perhaps accuracy around breath testing, too. <laughs> yeah, but as I said, I can't comment more than that because yeah, no, no, that's yeah. fine. I appreciate it. Thank you. Dr. Horolak, Dr. Horolak, thank you so much for your time. It's always a, a real treat, as I say, to be able to speak with you and, and to learn from your experience and your knowledge. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure and a stimulating conversation. <laughs> Two hours. Yeah. <laughs>